what I'm going to do before I speak and tell my story is I'm going to show a short video. The video is about five minutes long. It was done ten years ago by Good Morning America. After I was healed, they were kind of curious as to what this was all about. So they started a series called Miracles. I don't know if they're doing it anymore, but they did my story. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it will give you a point of reference to the talk. So you'll see Medjugorje, you'll see my doctor, you'll see Ivan Dragicevich, one of the missionaries. Uh, before we begin, how many people have ever heard of Medjugorje? Good number. How many have been there? Just a few. Well, after the talk, maybe you'll change your mind and decide to go. But without further ado, we can show the video. The only thing better than seeing joy on a child's face is to have a few put it there. Bullet tests that they call miracles. We begin with a story of a Boston man who made a pilgrimage to a sacred site in search of his own miracle. Shine and humble. 
the love, forgiveness, and message of hope. Those are my options. These are the most important messages. No one can definitively explain the miracles of Medjugorje, and some may not, but Arthur Boyle has his own thoughts. I'm not sure why I was healed. Uh, I'm grateful. Some people are skeptical. Uh, but all I have to do is look at it. Still here. The series that we're going to continue each Friday. Next up. Uh, One of the reasons I like to show that video is you saw sorry, Ivan with a Red Sox jacket on. Uh, I lived in Boston half the year as well as uh, in Medjugorje. He's a huge Red Sox fan, so yeah, that's why I want to show you that. I want to thank Sister Jean and Father Casey for allowing me to come and speak tonight. Um, um, sometimes the church does not yet approve Medjugorje, so some pastors aren't as willing to allow that, but my story is my story, and regardless of what people think and believe in Medjugorje, hopefully. When we're done, you'll have a better understanding. In Luke 17, 11, Jesus came upon ten lepers. They asked him to heal them. He told them to go see the priests. On the way to see the priests, one of them, a Samaritan, realized he'd been healed and went running back to give praise and thanks and glory to Jesus. Jesus said to him, There were ten of you, were there not? Where are the other nine? Because of that passage in the gospel, I've promised to give witness to the healing power of Jesus Christ wherever and whenever I was asked. And it's taken me all over the world. I've spoken in front of groups of 65,000 people in Medjugorje, 6,000 people just a few weeks ago in Vienna, Austria, and to little second grade classes. So it goes to all exchanges, many, many churches. And it's such a gift to be able to tell the story because each time it brings me back to my own healing. There's a little story I tell each time it's about a farmer. And the farmer was the richest farmer in the village because he owned the horse. Well, one day the horse disappeared. All the neighbors came over and said, this is terrible. The horse did all the work. What are you going to do? And the farmer said, it could be good, it could be bad. Who knows? A few days later, the horse returned. Brought with it many other horses. They filled the corral. The neighbors excitedly came over and said, this is fantastic. We all get a horse. We can all get our work done. And the farmer said, it could be good. Could be bad. Who knows? The farmer decided to put the horses to work, had his son train one of the horses. The horse threw the boy. He fell and broke his leg. Again, the neighbors came over lamenting how terrible this is. He was your only son. He did all the work. And again, the farmer said, could be good, could be bad. Who knows? A couple days later, the military come through the village, collecting up all the young men. They get to the farmer's house. The boy's in bed in a cast, and they pass him by. Could be good, could be bad, who knows. The moral of the story is that God has a plan in all of our lives. And oftentimes, when it's not going so well, or it's not going as we had planned, if we can just stop and trust and pray, He will take care of it for us. In our, my own life, Judy and I, we got married at a very young age. Judy was 18, and I just turned 19. We had to leave school, didn't have a job, and everybody said, you're not going to make it. Well, 40 years later, 13 children later, 17 grandchildren later, I'm sure that's going to grow. We're doing just fine. <laughs> my second child, Artie, my oldest boy, was born autistic. To have an autistic child at any age is very difficult. But when you're so young, we had no idea what to do. But with a lot of help and a lot of effort, Artie is now the joy of the family. He wins gold medals in the Special Olympics, and he is by far our easiest child. <laughs> <laughs> My eighth child, Joseph Anthony, died at the age of two months from sudden infant death syndrome, the most devastating thing my family's ever had to go through. The death of any child is difficult. We were very young, but a lot of prayers, a lot of tears, and a lot of support. We eventually realized what a great gift life is and we need to enjoy every moment we have on Earth. And at the age of 44, I got cancer. And when someone tells you you have cancer, you immediately start to think, how much time do I have to live? All this crazy stuff goes through your head. And a lot of people are afraid and scared when they get cancer. Many of you here may have been touched by cancer or some other disease. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. Getting cancer for me 
was the best thing that ever happened to me. It brought me back to God. In September of 1999, I became ill. I played a couple of sports in college. I was a real avid golfer. At the time, I couldn't play four holes of golf without having to stop. There was a burning inside my body. I went and had a physical done, and they found I was anemic, which is unusual for a man. So they sent me for more tests. And they found I had a GI doctor found I had the severe, severe and gross of esophagitis, or Barrett's esophagus, which is a very common malady. They put me on a medicine. They told me to come back in a month. A month later, I went back to see the doctor. I had lost 45 pounds. My face was that gray cancer color. My face was caved in. And the doctor said, well, I guess the medicine hasn't worked yet. So we're going to keep going for another month. Had I done that, I wouldn't be standing here today. I went home and told my wife what the doctor said. She said, that's crazy. We're going to get you into a Boston hospital. And she called the Mass General. And the Mass General said, sure, we can see your husband in about a month. So she started to pray. As she prayed, our back door bell in Massachusetts rang. It was a dear friend of ours that lived 200 miles away, just happened to be in the neighborhood. He came in, Judy put on a tee, told them my story, and he said, my sister works at the Mass General. They made a phone call, two days later, they had an appointment. I went to see a doctor who did a battery of tests and found nothing. He sent me to see a hematologist who did a whole bunch of tests, found nothing. Finally, I said, my daughter is a medical school student. She thinks I should have a CT scan. And he agreed. They sent me to an off-site facility of the Mass General in Chelsea, Mass, to have a CT scan. A CT scan is a pretty simple procedure. You lie on a table, they slide you in and out, it looks like a big donut, and they tell you to hold your breath. All they're doing is taking pictures. They told me I wasn't breathing right, and they needed to take more pictures. I had no idea what they meant. When it was over, the test, they said, we won't have the results for a day or two, so you can leave. But on my way home, heading through the central artery of Boston in rush hour traffic, the last thing I wanted to do was get off and go into Mass General, but something was pulling me in that direction. And when I got close, my cell phone rang, it was the doctor's secretary, the doctor wants to see you. When I got upstairs, he was standing in his doorway, waiting for me. He brought me in, after you fall. <laughs> he brought me in, he sat me down, he looked me in the eye, and he said, you have renal cell carcinoma, cancer of the kidney. The intensity of that statement, I will never forget. You immediately think, how's Judy going to handle 13 years? Who's going to teach the boys how to play ball? Who's going to protect the girls from the boys? All this crazy stuff goes through your head in an instant. He said, I need to send you to see an oncologist right away. When I left his office, I stumbled out of there, and I went to the cancer ward at Mass General. It was called COX-2. And I sat there for three hours. When I was finally able to lift my head out of my hands and look around the room, I could see there were people in that room a lot worse off than I was. And I started to think to myself, I can beat this cancer. I can fight this. I've been athletically trained. Not once did I think about God. The doctor finally called me into his room brought up on the computer monitor the pictures they had just taken. It showed a tumor the size of my fist sitting on my kidney, the pancreas wrapped around the tumor, and the spleen and the lymph nodes were infected as well. It was not a pretty picture. He said to me, I need to send you to see the urologist immediately to have all of this cut out. I said, Doc, I've been dealing with this since 8 o'clock in the morning. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm exhausted. And I, I haven't even composed myself yet. I need to go home and tell my wife, and she'll ask all the questions. He scheduled the appointment with Dr. Frank and got the doctor you saw on the video for 8 o'clock the next morning. We went in to see Dr. McGovern. He's a surgeon. A surgeon is very pragmatic. They don't pull any punches. They tell you exactly what they think is going to happen. He told me this is going to be a very ugly procedure. We're going to have a pancreatic surgeon in the operating room. We need to take some of the pancreas. He said it's going to bleed through the wound. And for 40 minutes, he went on to tell us how terrible this was going to be. My wife did not say a single word during the entire consultation. And I later found out she was rebuking everything the doctor said. And she was praying. Surgery was scheduled for December 9th, 1999. We had 21 days. In James 5, 14, 16, it says, are you sick? 
If so, go see the presbyters of the church, the leaders, the priests, and have them pray over you, just as Jesus sent the lepers. We took this literally. My wife put my name, Lorena de St. Anthony, and her and her sisters put hundreds of them throughout the South Shore. People were praying for me everywhere. We went to many healing services where kids would lay hands on me, or adults, it was very moving. But the most dramatic healing service that I went to was at the Mission Church in Roxbury with Father Ed McDonough. The Mission Church is a healing shrine right here in Boston. And it's, it's really a huge church, and I strongly suggest you pay a visit someday. It's well worth it. Well, I had cancer, but I still had to go to work. So I'm at work, and my wife calls me up, and she says, I'm going to take you to a healing service, and I want you to be ready. Now, I do everything my wife tells me. <laughs> right, well, so I was ready. I locked my car door, and I got into her car. And on the radio was a woman talking to a priest about Blessed Faustina. Never heard of her before. I listened to this story, now St. Faustina, obviously, in the Chapel of Divine Mercy, all the way in to the Mission Church. And my wife looked at me while we're driving, and she said, I need to get you a miraculous medal. It has great power. And at the time, I didn't wear any jewelry at all, never mind religious jewelry. We got to the Mission Church. I went into the back of the church, like a good Catholic, I sat in the very back. And I knelt down and I prayed with my heart for the first time in my life. And to pray with your heart means to truly let go and give it to God and to pray with love. I was never able to do that before. Something, while I was praying, something physical struck me in the chest and knocked me backwards. And I said to Judy, what was that? She said, what was what? And we continued to pray. Father God came down, prayed over me. This incredible warmth through my body, and my skin color changed right in front of my wife's eyes from the gray cancer color to my normal pink. I had my bloods tested the next day, they were back to normal. Scientific improbability. However, that day, Judy dropped me at work, she went home. On the voicemail at home was a woman from our parish saying, Mrs. Boyle, you don't know me, but I've been praying for your husband and I on the Novena to St. Anthony. Several months ago, I lost a relic. I was cleaning out my attic, I found the relic, and I want Artie to have it. It's a relic of Blessed Faustina. That night, I get in my car to go home, I unlock the door, and on the passenger seat is a miraculous medal on a man's chain. I call up my wife on my cell phone immediately, I say, that was fast, how'd you do that? She said, do what? To this day, we have no idea how the medal got there, nobody in my family so we pass it around to the family for those that are in need. I started to realize that God was trying to make an impression on me, and I better start this thing. My surgery was December 9th. On December 8th, at the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, they held an all-night prayer vigil for me. We started with Mass, and then people prayed all night long. The most powerful prayer we have in our faith is the Holy Mass. If you want to have a mass said to somebody, I suggest you have it said for them while they're still alive. It is very <coughs> powerful. I coached a team of eight-year-old kids, little kids. They walked up the center aisle with the hockey jerseys, the hockey team, and they put them over the front pew. Very powerful stuff. The next morning, my dad picked me up to take me to the hospital, and he took me to the National General Hospital, which is a training hospital. I didn't know that. The anesthesiologist that was going to put the epidural in me was in residency. He wasn't an anesthesiologist quite yet. And if you know what an epidural is, they stick a needle in your spine to numb your whole lower part of your body. Because they were going to cut me from here all the way across and up my back. Literally, they were cutting me in half. Well, this guy, when he was trying to put the needle in, was having a lot of difficulty. I could actually hear it. Finally, I get into the operating room. Dr. McGovern pricks my leg with a pin, and I say, ow. Well, I'm not supposed to say ow. <laughs> he waits five more minutes, and he does it again. And I say, ow. And he goes, well, tch, we're just going to go ahead with the local. I'm like, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm lying on the table like I'm not even there. Eventually, I guess the medicine started to take effect. But during the operation, the epidural fell out. 
So when I woke up, literally cut in half, once the wall wore off, the pain was so excruciating that I was in and out of consciousness. And I'm telling you this for a reason. While I was in there, they discovered I had a nodule in my thyroid that had to come out. So the anesthesiologist this time hit me with a muscle relaxant prior to the anesthesia. When that happens, this liquid goes through your body. It is so cold, and it goes through your body at supersonic speed, and it feels like it's going to come flying out your mouth. And you immediately go, oh my god, and the doctor stops, but then they hit you with the anesthesia, and you're out. But anesthesia is designed so you forget the surgery. In this case, because it wasn't done properly, I remembered everything. That was the bad stuff. The good stuff was during the operation, the pancreatic surgeon was not needed. A membrane had grown between the pancreas and the tumor, protecting the pancreas. So that all they took out was the kidney, the tumor, the adrenal gland, and whatever else. And the pancreas was left to sit in the kidney bit. It was just fine. When I got home a few weeks later, the doctor called me up on the, my cell phone, left a message, said, it's literally screaming into the phone, this is fantastic, the margins are clear, we got it all, congratulations, you're going to have a normal life. I hung up the phone and I was stunned. And I remember thinking to myself, I didn't expect to hear that. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for letting me stay with my family. What can I do for you? I'll do anything. Just tell me. Well, I didn't hear anything. So I didn't do anything. <laughs> Very typical of a man. And I went right back into the rat race, chasing the almighty doll, running around with kids to every sporting event in the world that it was. Well, once you're a cancer patient, you tend to stay a cancer patient. Three months later, I go back into tests, same radiologist, everything's fine. Eight months later, the same two babies once again. They told me I wasn't breathing right. They needed to take more pictures. <laughs> And I started to get concerned. I went back to see the doctor. The first thing he said to me was, I am overworked. Not exactly something you want to hear from somebody that's trying to save your life. He said, what do you mean? And he brought up on the computer monitors, again, the pictures they had just taken. It showed three tumors in my right lung. The cancer had metastasized. Metastatic renal cell carcinoma has no cure. There is no chemotherapy. There is no radiation. There is only extraction. So the next trip was to go see the thoracic surgeon. I was learning all these new names. We went to see the thoracic surgeon. This time I brought my daughter, who was in medical school, and her husband, my son-in-law, who was also in medical school. They were going to ask all the questions. We meet with Dr. Wright at the Mass General. He's sitting behind his big desk, because that's what they said to protect themselves. <laughs> And he gave me, he said, I'm going to cut open his ribs, I'm going to take his lung out, I'm going to put it on the table, and I'm going to feel with my hands to make sure I get all the cancer. And after the two previous surgeries and the anesthesia I had there, there was no way I was going to let this guy touch me. I was thinking to myself, sitting there listening to this, I would rather die than let them do this to me again. That's how painful it was. My daughter and her husband, however, agreed. This is what has to happen, you have no choice. So the depression that sits in, that sets in is so powerful, you can barely put one foot in front of the other. The anxiety, the depression. The doctor said to me, go home and put your house in order. You have less than 5% chance to survive this surgery. I went home that night, my little son Timmy, who was eight years old at the time, looked at me and he said, Daddy, are you gonna die? I don't know what you're telling me, you old kid. I had no words other than to say, no, no, we're fine, we're going to keep praying, which we did. We kept praying. We kept going to healing services. <coughs> a couple of days later, Kevin Gill, my best friend, and my brother-in-law, and a good friend of mine, Rod Griffin, were paired up to play golf together. They'd never played golf together before. And Robbie said to Kevin, how's that going? And Kevin said, not too good, and told him the story. Robbie said, have you ever heard of Medjugorje? And Kevin said, no. And Robbie explained to Kevin what Medjugorje was. And he had tried to get his dad to Medjugorje, who was very sick, but unfortunately was unable to make it. So Robbie was determined to try and help. Kevin called me up and he said, Artie, did you ever hear of Medjugorje? I said, yeah, 
daughter gave my wife a book on the messages to Medjugorje 10 years earlier. And my wife would sit up at night with that book, and while I'm watching the sports, would try to read me those messages. It went in one ear and out the other. I never heard a word she said, other than Medjugorje. Kevin said, do you want to go? I said, why not? They had scheduled surgery September 14th of 2000. Kevin said we'll go on September 4th to September 10th. It was truly a trip of desperation. <laughs> we got on a plane to go to Medjugorje, but prior to that, my wife had got into a Bible study, and she went in with my little five-year-old son at the time, Nicholas. She went into the adult section, he went into the kindergarten section, and when he came out, she said, Nick, what did you learn? He said, Luke 1.13, be not afraid, your prayer has been heard. Later in the week, while I was in Medjugorje, she said, Nick, what did you learn? Luke 1.37, nothing is impossible with God. Two things my wife needed to hear while her husband was halfway across the world in Medjugorje. When we got on the plane, an excitement started to set in for me. This was a week later, we were on a plane, I didn't have a passport, everything came together very quickly. We kept a journal, and in the journal I wrote, I'm going to Medjugorje to be healed and to see the Blessed Mother. And although I may not actually see her, I know I'll be touched by her in some way. Faith defined is the confident assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet unseen. I had written in that book the confident assurance of things hoped for, and I would later get the evidence of things yet unseen. The best way I can describe Medjugorje, and I have many friends here, we just came back from Medjugorje a few weeks ago, it's a place of supernatural peace. And it's a place of supernatural peace because the thousands of people that go there pray, go to adoration, go to mass, go to the rosary, climb the hills, meditate, and that's all it's done. So of course it's going to be peaceful. A long time ago, they built a church in the center of the village of Medjugorje, the Church of St. James. The church holds about 1,100 people. There were 400 people in the village at the time. Why did they build such a big church? To the left of that church, when I went, originally were all boxes, the confessionals. Robbie and Kevin and I hadn't been in confession in almost 20 years, I'm sorry to say. The first thing we did was go to confession. After confession, we went into the church. It was filled with people standing in the aisles, praying the rosary. And in between the decades of the rosary, they sang. And when all those people sang with such conviction, the Ave Maria, it literally lifted my soul into heaven, and I knew I was in the right place in Medjugorje. We left the church. We were going to meet our guy, Jelka. Jelka was the cousin of Visca. Visca is one of the missionaries. Each of the visionaries has a task to pray for a group, the youth, the family, priests, the sick, whatever. Visca, her task was to pray for the sick. So Robbie had set up through Sister Margaret Sims that I would be prayed over by Visca. Well, Jelka met us and said, I'm sorry I have bad news. Visca had to go to Rome to visit a sick friend, and she will not be able to pray over you. It was disappointing, but we were in Medjugorje. The next day we got up, we went to Mass. After Mass, Jelka said, what would you like to do? We said, well, we'd like to get our wives something nice. So she took us to a little jewelry store, Leo's, down the street. And three grown men spent 45 minutes buying jewelry. Normally it's go in, conquer, get out. <laughs> we didn't do that. I bought five rosary bead bracelets for my daughters, and I was looking at the gold crosses and chains for my sons. And I was thinking to myself, this is expensive. But then I said to myself, if I can spend the money I spend on golf, hockey, and all the other stuff I waste money on, I can certainly spend it on Jesus. As that thought went through my head, there was a commotion immediately to my left. Kevin came over, put his arm around me, and he said, do you know who that is standing right next to you? It was a small woman. I said, no. It was Visca. She had missed her plan from the night before, just happened to stop at this jewelry store to buy a rosary ring, and she was now standing right next to me. Jelica explained who I was, 
Visca took her little tiny hand, put it right on my forehead, it was like a vice grip, and she started to pray. Robbie and Kevin put their hands on my shoulder, and the heat that went through my body caused them to sweat. That was the beginning of our trip to Medjugorje. We had all kinds of things happen to us. We had rosary beads turn to gold. We saw the sun spin and dancing. All those things are nice little touches for the people that are in Medjugorje. They're not at all what Medjugorje is all about. Medjugorje is all about what's to the left of St. James Church, the confessionals. After we were in the jewelry store, we were going to go up to Cross Mountain. You saw it on the video. It's a big cross that in 1933 was built by these villages at the top of this mountain to help protect the crops. It weighs 15 tons. These people had to go up through briar, rock, impassable stuff, but they did it because how strong their faith was. It was said that the Blessed Mother played, prays there at sunrise every day. So we wanted to go up and pray with Our Lady. Well, when we passed the jewelry store to go up the mountain, Kevin looked over at the left of the church, the confessionals, and said, you know something, guys? I think I forgot a couple of things. I'm going back to confession. Well, he went back, and Robbie and I waited in our room. After a little while, the door bursts open. Kevin comes in and says, you've got to go back to confession. There's an incredible priest there from Liverpool, England. He's only going to be there for five more minutes. You've got to hurry up. He was so convicted in what he was telling us that the three of us jump up and go sprinting down Main Street Medjugorje to go to a place we tried to avoid for the last 20 years. <laughs> it made no sense. We're running out. What are we doing? Well, when we got there, I get into the confessional and I met Father Simon Kent Wallado from Liverpool, England. Father Simon was a very beautiful, soft spoken priest. He was a late vocation priest. He's in the St. James Society, so he was in the missions of Peru, where he still is today. He became a very dear friend of us. We met the guy in a box in Medjugorje. To this day, he spent two, three, four weeks at a time with us here, staying at Robbie's or Kevin's, and many people here, I'm sure, have been exposed to his masses, which have come out. In that confession, he told me many things. But he said, the Eucharist, is the most powerful medicine we have on earth. Take Jesus into your body as often as possible and ask him to heal you. He told me many, many other things. He had already talked to Robbie and already had talked to Kevin. And he could sense in us a building excitement. And he said, one piece of advice. When you go home, preach the gospel. And when you have to, use words. In the words of St. Francis. He said, if you go back and start spouting off about Medjugorje, people are going to think you're a whack job. They're not going to listen to you. So we did exactly what he told us to do. Just lived our lives. When I left the confessional, the depression, the anxiety that was weighing so heavily upon me, lifted, completely gone. And I instantly realized that I was invited to Medjugorje by Our Lady, not for physical for a spiritual healing. Because until we are spiritually healed, we cannot be physically healed. So if we want to be physically healed, we have to work on our spirituality. I knew this to be true in Medjugorje, and I just had to come back and tell everybody back here, especially guys, because we are the ones that tend to avoid those places. But we left there, we went up the mountain. On the way up the mountain, they told us don't go, it was raining, it's very dangerous. It is, it's very slippery. But we went anyway, the three of us. And on the way up, there was a pain in my lung that was killing me. And I said to myself, man, it's getting worse. But as we get up the top of the mountain, we got a gift. That mountain can have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of people on it, especially when the weather's nice. When we get to the top, there was nobody there. Not a soul, just Robert and Kevin and myself. We started pleading with Jesus out loud on top of that mountain to heal me. We were embracing. We were weeping. These are not things we would have ever done here in this country. Never. Still haven't. But we did it there. Came down off the mountain. I called my wife. And I said, I don't know what's going on over here. But something is happening. Please call the doctor and get another CT scan before they cut off my right lung. 
She called the doctor. The doctor's secretary called me back and on my cell phone left a message. Mr. Boyle, we know you're in Medjugorje. We know why you're there. That's a beautiful thing. But the fact is, you have cancer and it's not going to disappear. <coughs> so we're going to go ahead with the surgery. <coughs> my wife did what any good wife would do. She got another doctor. <laughs> <laughs> this doctor had been originally recommended to us. Why we didn't take him, I don't know. But when I finally met him, he had sent his parents to Medjugorje and had a picture of Medjugorje hanging in his office wall. We were also scheduled to meet with Father Yozo Zovko. The reason we were going to meet with Father Yozo was he was the original pastor in Medjugorje. And in 1981, when the apparition started happening on June 24 in Medjugorje, it was a communist country. Father Yozo was the pastor at the time, a young man. And the communists condemned any outside activity of faith other than the church itself. They allowed them to practice. So when these kids started saying they were seeing the blessed mother, he was very concerned. Everybody was going to get stopped thrown in jail. He scolded the children. And then the blessed mother appeared to him. And he became a protector. Well, he protected them to the point where he got thrown in jail. He spent 18 months in prison. When they finally let him out, they would not let him go back to Medjugorje. He went to Soroki Bridge, 30 miles away. So we wanted to go see him so he could pray over me, which we did. When we got in there, we met him. He had a translator. Her name was Nancy and her husband, Patrick. Nancy said, isn't it wonderful the leaders of American families would come to Medjugorje to pray? Please come see me before you leave. We said we would. But as coincidence or God instance would have it, Father McDonald happened to be at Medjugorje at the same time as us. He fell, he hurt himself so badly that there was a big commotion and we lost track of Nancy and Patrick. The day we were leaving Medjugorje, a woman approached us and said, do you want to see Nancy? We said, yes, of course. We followed her through the fields. We got to her castle, her and Patrick's castle. It's literally a castle. And we sat in the courtyard and after a while, everybody disappeared. Just Nancy, Robbie, and Kevin, and myself. Kevin gave Nancy a pen and a paper to take the information, or Nancy and Patrick's information. And Nancy took it and bowed her head to pray. And after a few minutes, she looked up, she looked me in the eye, and she said, You need to forgive. I said, Forgive? I've been to confession twice. I got nothing left. She said, You need to forgive your mother and father. And my mother and father had just gotten divorced after 43 years of marriage, and I immediately broke down. Once again, crying healing tears in Medjugorje. Robbie broke down, he just lost his father. Kevin broke down, his father was still, it was just a mess. But it was very powerful healing tears. I called my wife and I said, please have my entire family present when I get home. My mother, my father, my brothers, my sister, their spouses, my kids, their spouses, and she did that. And I brought my father in front of the family, and I forgave him for divorcing my mother. My mother didn't like it, but she knew it was something I had to do. So, uh, we had a CT scan scheduled for two days before the surgery. I went into that CT scan, same technicians. They told me I wasn't breathing right. They needed to take more pictures. I started to get excited. I went flying back to the doctor's office, ran up to his office, was at one of the films, told me to wait. A few minutes later, called me into his office. And instead of sitting behind the big desk for his protection, he was standing in the threshold, rubbing his fingers to his chin, saying, they're gone. A large tumor had completely disappeared, and two smaller tumors had shrunk to such insignificant size that on September 14th, the feast of the triumph of the cross, instead of having my right lung cut out, the oncologist, the urologist, and the thoracic surgeon all got together and canceled the surgery. I was playing golf with Robbie and Kevin. Jesus Christ, through the intercession of his blessed mother, had healed me in Medjugorje. In Medjugorje, Our Lady invites us to do many things. She invites us to form prayer groups, which we did. In January of 2001, we meet every Thursday night at St. Paul's we pray a rosary in a chaplet and hang on. Thousands of people have been through that prayer group. It still continues to this day. 
She has messages for the world. And she asks us, or invites us, always, to pray the rosary. Pray the rosary with your family. And she says, dear children, there can be no peace in the world until there is peace in the family. And there can be no peace in the family until there is prayer in the family. Pray the rosary. It's one of our most powerful prayers. She invites us to read the Bible. The Bible is our water, our sustenance. Put it in a place of prominence and use it. Read it. Don't use it as a bookmark or whatever. Just use it. She invites us to go to monthly confession. She doesn't invite us to go once a year. She invites us to go monthly. In John 20, Jesus breathed on him and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go out and forgive them their sins. Those sins you forgive are forgiven. Those sins you retain are retained. Confession in our faith is not an option. It's a sacrament given to us by Jesus, which gives us a grace, which enables us to walk in the light of Christ. This is what was put in my heart in Medjugorje. This is what I had to come back and tell people. Go to confession, because it does a lot of things. It keeps us in the right path. Our Lady invites us to go once a month, because we need it. She invites us to fast on bread and water on Wednesdays and Fridays. Very difficult thing to do. And if you can't fast, she invites you to give something up. Something you really want. Because it gives you a discipline over your body. And oftentimes when I talk to the teenage kids, especially all the athletes, I say, you guys are totally disciplined. You work out, you watch what you eat. Discipline. It gives us more powerful prayer. And the most important one is she invites us to go to Holy Mass as often as possible. Because that's where her son is. She says to the children, dear children, if you have an opportunity to come see me, or to go to Holy Mass, don't come see me. Go to Mass. That's where my son is. And for them, it's very difficult because when they see her, they see her as you see me. They talk to her, they touch her, they, everything. So when she says, don't come see me, it's very powerful. I've been in Medjugorje 14 times. I, the most recent with a bunch of my buddies, my new friends. But I went one time with my family and two of my kids really didn't want to go at all. My daughter Catherine went over there kicking and screaming. The next year she went back to Metroboria, worked for six weeks with Nancy Patrick, which is not an easy task. Then came home from there and started teaching theology in Boston Catholic high schools for the past 10 years. And she now works at the Archdiocese of Boston in the as a trainer for the new evangelization. My son Chris was kind of lost didn't know what he wanted to do. He came back from Medjugorje, started teaching theology at Catholic Memorial High School. And as Sister Jean said, he's now in his second year in the seminary and will be going to Rome to study in the North American College. The Blessed Mother grabbed my children and did things that my wife and I could never do. And we will be forever grateful to everything she's done. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says, I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live Jesus Christ in others. And I hope from all of you are crucified with Christ. You no longer live in the Jesus Christ will live in you. And by the way, I did have to good keep going back for tests. And I went for three months, then for six months, and then once a year. So after a few years, I went up to my oncologist and I said, Doctor, I don't need to have these tests anymore. I have a deal with Jesus Christ. He said to me, you know something? The barium we're putting in your body is probably doing you more harm than good. He said to me, congratulations. You graduated from the school of oncology. And I said to him, did I graduate cum laude? <laughs> he said, no, you graduated summa cum laude. Very few people ever graduate from the school of oncology. I left there and a few years prior to that, I told you I had those two little modules that shrunk, but they were still there. I had been biopsied prior to that, and we knew it was renal cell. Well, I was finally able to get up the guts to let me go in and surgically remove those 
two little modules. This was a year after I came back from Medjugorje. They were able to do it laparoscopically, and the reason I did it is I met Ivan Dragisevich, one of the visionaries, the children. And we had become good friends. That's too long a story to tell, but we had become good friends. And he said, have the surgery. The Blessed Mother will be in the operating room. Father Simon said, have the surgery. Jesus' hands will be the hands of the surgeon. I didn't think I had a choice. I had the surgery. They took out two chunks of my lung. It was renal cell carcinoma. The renal cell should not have sat there. It should have either killed me or disappeared altogether. Confounded the doctors a bit. But the next time I went in to have x-rays done, it showed a perfectly healthy, normal, right lung with very little evidence of any extractions whatsoever. Jesus Christ, through the intercession of his blessed mother Mary, <coughs> healed me in Medjugorje. Medjugorje is currently being started, studied by the Vatican. They're not going to make an announcement. I don't believe they can as long as the aberrations are continuing. Hopefully someday they make it a shrine because in Medjugorje there's been 1,400 vocations to the priesthood. There have been 40 million plus confessions heard, 40 million plus Eucharists given out. People go to adoration. People pray all the time. When John Paul II was asked, should the people go to Medjugorje? John Paul II said to him, are they praying Medjugorje? Yes. Are they going to Mass? Yes. Are they going to Confession? Yes. Well then tell them to go to Medjugorje. <laughs> Why not? Because that's what our faith is all about. If anybody's ever interested in going, I know many of you have gone, but if anybody else is interested in going, I'd be happy to give you my email address, and we can show you how to get there. It's very safe. It's wonderful. It's very peace-filled. I've been over several times with just men. I try to go with just a men's group. The ladies always seem to get in there. <laughs> because it was pressed in my heart in Medjugorje that men need to pray. Men are the heads of the home. Women are the heart of the home. Women get it. We don't get it so much. We don't let it, let it up. We men need to we need our family in prayer. If we do that, this world, and we'll wait in place. Thank you. God bless you.